This is the You Show Podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome in to the You Show Podcast. I'm Chris Treft. I'm with Voice of the Bucks, Ben Gisselson. I know, I know this one's going to be a tough one to follow up on John Butchergrass that we had earlier in the week, but nonetheless, Troy Grosnick, goaltender for the Milwaukee Admirals and the Nashville Predators, incredible human being. We actually talked maybe more about off-ice stuff than we did about hockey, but that's how good of a, a, a person Troy is. And just to, to win AHL Man of the Year is very tough because a lot of guys in the American Hockey League do so much for the community. And to win that and for all the stuff he does in pretty much his hometown, right, he's a Wisconsin guy. So it's, it's just a testament to how good of a person he is. And it was a really good interview, and it was very impactful. Like, you might find yourself really thinking and, and looking at it, and, you know, like, you almost get a tear in your eye, some of the stuff he talks about and some of the stuff he goes through. So we talked hockey, as always, because he had an incredible USHL career. But we also stepped aside from hockey and talked about other things and well with just a, a great guy and ambassador for hockey. AHL Man of the Year for a reason this year. It's a great achievement. And it was a great interview for different reasons than why we enjoyed interviewing John Butchagrass. It was, like you said, Chris, I think impactful was a great way to describe it. It was very evident to me how involved Troy Grosnick wants to be in his community. And it's kind of been a perfect storm for him to win man of the year in the AHL, because like you said, being a local Milwaukee guy, he's obviously going to have a vested interest in the Milwaukee community while playing for the Admirals. And he clearly took advantage of that. Uh, it seemed like uh, not only a, a genuine person, but a smart person and someone who has a lot of care in his life around the sport of hockey, not just on the ice, but off of it. And uh, talked a lot about his wife and his kids and how important they are to him. And um, it, it's interesting. I always talk to this with buddies of mine when, they ask, and not that, not that you and I, Chris, have a huge window into the hockey world here, but we, we do get to interview some pretty, pretty cool guests, right? And the one thing I always take away from these guests is sometimes we put these players on a pedestal, right? You talk to Ryan Suter, and you're like, oh, it's Ryan Suter. And then you come away and you realize he's just like you or like me or like your buddies. He's, he's just an average normal guy that happens to be insanely skilled at hockey. So to get to talk to Troy like we did and, and to hear a little bit more about the game away from the game for him, I thought was really special and I really enjoyed it. When you start to notice that too, you know, I've had the opportunity to work in pro ice hockey. You have dabbled in it here and there, and I know you have a great mm-hmm. team in hockey. So eventually you're going to get to that point and meet these players and get to know guys at, at a higher level. I have full faith in that for you. So, I mean, it, you understand that it's, these guys are just normal dudes. Like, yeah, you can look up to them, but, you know, worshiping players sometimes, it's kind of weird to think about because, like, they're, they're just good human beings. We see that interviewing these people, and this is another good one. And is he a guy that hasn't had much NHL experience to this point? Yes, but he's going to make the NHL. He's the late bloomer, just like Staylock. We talked to Staylock earlier. They've all had almost identical careers. But when – Grossnick gets his opportunity in the NHL. He's going to run with it because he's that good of a player. And I think good things come to good people. And with his work ethic and with his maturity level, I mean, he's going to get an opportunity in the NHL. And I have full confidence that he's going to run with it. I firmly agree with that. It's a great point. The analogous careers Al Stalock and Troy Grossnick have had. And interestingly enough, both Cedar Rapids Rough Riders along too. But I agree. I think, especially with goaltending too, goaltending can be so finicky and strange And you'll look at goalies and just think, man, how has this guy not stuck somewhere? And a lot of it is so circumstantial for him. And you look at where Troy has been the majority of his career, starting in San Jose and then now in Nashville. Now, San Jose's goaltending right now isn't quite what it was. But when Troy was there, I mean, there was quite a pecking order to get through to make your way to the top of, of their depth chart. And the same goes in Nashville right now. So and that's not saying that something won't happen in Nashville and it might not happen there, but I'm with you. I'm with you, Chris. I think when that opportunity comes to really, okay, Troy, we're going to give you a shot at taking the pipes. I have full confidence in him that he's going to take it. 
Well, we've talked about how great an interview is, but now it's time to listen. Here is our interview with Troy Grossman. Well, ladies and gentlemen, joining us now on the U Show podcast is the reigning man of the year in the American Hockey League and goaltender for the Milwaukee Admirals, Troy Grosnick. Troy, how are you doing today, sir? Good. Thanks for having me, guys. Obviously, it was an incredible year for the Milwaukee Admirals. It was an incredible year for you on and off the ice. And we use the, the word incredible loosely because it was a strange ending with the with current situation going on in the world and everything. But for you, why did you have so much success this year with Milwaukee? I mean, we just had a really uh, great group of guys that, I mean, obviously the skill was there and we knew that on paper going into the season. And, and, and we felt really good about what we had early on. And, um, you know, just a really good mix of, of young guys and some vets that have been there before. But like I said, um, the skill we had, toughness and grit, we kind of had all those elements that we thought we could be a really successful team. And, um, you know, the X factor was just having the chemistry that we built throughout the year. And it was, uh, it was one of the closer teams I've ever been on. And um, I think it really showed, like, it wasn't just guys playing for themselves, um, which you can get in the American Hockey League a little bit. Um, but it was a lot of, a lot of guys just pulling on the same rope and, and, you know, we built friendships that it was, you were playing for the guy next to you just as much as you were playing for, for yourself and the advancement of your career. So it was just a lot of fun to be part of that. And obviously winning helps, but I think um, those two things go hand in hand. It's obviously easier to, to build team camaraderie when you're winning, but I think in order to win, you also have to build team camaraderie and, um, I think we did a really good job of that this year. And um, obviously, weren't able to go after our ultimate goal, the Calder Cup, but obviously bigger problems in the world right now. Um, and it's unfortunate that that our goals were ab weren't able to be fully fulfilled. But um, at the end of the day, it was a great regular season. And we got that regular season championship, which is pretty cool. You guys, you mentioned winning a lot there. Well, that was uh, an understatement. In 63 games, you guys were 41, 14, 5, and 3 for 90 points. That's incredible. And that is a testament to all the stuff you mentioned. But also, you were awarded Man of the Year in the AHL. So not only did you have a ton of success on the ice, but you were marvelous off of it as well in terms of community service and, and helping those in need and situations like that. What does that award mean to you, and why do you take so much pride and the off ice stuff. Yeah, it's kind of hard to get. It's it, not hard, but it's uh, it's different to get an award for community service because you're you're not doing it for awards. You're doing it to make an impact on people's lives. And at the end of the day, that's that's the real thing that I look back on and, and am proud of. That hopefully I was able to touch a kid's life and and make make it a little bit better in whatever way possible. And um, I just look back on, on growing up in the Milwaukee area um, is important for me to give back to a community that, you know, turned me into the person I am today. I had great teachers, coaches, mentors. My family was amazing. And I was afforded a lot of, of opportunity growing up. And um, I felt like giving back was the best way to pay some of that forward. And um, I just think every interaction with a kid is, is important. It might not even be out you know, doing community service type events. It can be just at their rink, you know, a smile and a wave, just making every interaction with the kid a positive one. Um, something that I try to take pride in. And I honestly, being a father now, especially, I, I just think that, you know, kids are the future. And if you can make an impact on one kid's life, that that's exponentially more important than you can do anything on your own because they're going to be here after we're gone. So if they can, uh, you know, hopefully take one positive thing and pass that sort of thing on, on to another kid when they're older. That's the way we make the world a better place. AHL organizations from coast to coast, Troy, do such a fabulous job of getting their teams involved in community outreach. But to win an award like this, you have to go above and beyond the calls, not just someone who tagged along on these different Milwaukee Admiral community outreach events. You had to take likely you had to take a lot of ownership and onus on yourself to get out and do some stuff on your own. What were some of those things that you took a lot of pride in that maybe the team wasn't doing, but you were doing on your own that really helped give back to the Milwaukee community? I think anything, anytime we did support with the Mac fund, um, Mac funds, an incredible organization, um, Midwest, Midwest athletes against childhood cancer. And obviously those kids and families are going through some trying times and, um, if you can put a smile on a kid's face, like I said, you're doing one thing, but being able to raise the amount of money that we were able to raise for them um, 
and hopefully, you know, one day no kid will have to go through cancer. And, and that's the end goal of, of the Mac fund. But um, it was really cool on, on a little bit of a selfish level too, because I was able to uh, participate in their charity softball game. So I got to meet like Robin Yount and, and some of my heroes growing up and they were, we were able to raise like over a hundred thousand dollars for the Mac fund that day alone. And then um, that kind of spurred me on to, to donate myself. Every, every save I made was a dollar towards the Mac fund and um, encouraged fans to, to chip in whatever they could too. Um, and then just every time that, uh, you know, you're able to make a visit to the hospital or anything like that, just put smiles on kids' faces that are going through really tough times. It's, uh, it's really important to me. And, uh, you know, that, that's probably the Mac fund is kind of the one that I kind of reached out to the most. Um, other ones that I wasn't a ton of like other guys on the team would have been like March of Dimes. We've recently, recently been doing some stuff with um, trying to support kids and moms, um, you know, that, that might have some underlying conditions that, uh, you know, the current pandemic could affect greatly. And just being able to raise money for, for the March of Dimes, obviously an incredible organization in its own right. But now that we have, have this put upon us, my wife's actually pregnant right now. So just knowing the question marks of something new um, being added to that, obviously everyone here has been healthy everything looks good with my wife and and with our our future daughter but um you know i can't even imagine if if you had a kid with with some sort of you know immunodeficiencies or other problems and, and having to deal with this and the march of dimes is kind of at, at the head of like polio and stuff like that too so um they know what they're doing when it comes to pandemics and it's been cool to be able to try to help out in, in whatever way I can. A big congratulations to you, not only for the man of the year award in the AHL, but for your impending uh, continuation of your fatherhood. That's great news for, for you and your wife. So congratulations there. We've talked a lot about kids already early in this podcast. I want to get back to when you were a kid in the Milwaukee area, growing up as a goaltender there. And for you, the USHL, was it on the radar? Was it off the radar? Was it a rite of passage to get to where you knew you wanted to get to? Take us back to that time and where the USHL was on your timeline. Yeah, I, I know the USHL was definitely um, on the roadmap at a certain point. I don't know in terms of how old I really was when I realized what the USHL was. Um, probably pretty on in, into playing AAA hockey, I would imagine, which I, I started playing AAA when I was in sixth grade. and. Um, we would play tournaments in Des Moines and, you know, during the Buck Bowl and, or see the Buccaneers play, got to play at the Buck Bowl and um, played down in Bensonville a lot. Actually, my last year midget, I played at Team Illinois, so that was our home rink at the time, um, but saw a lot of steel games there too. Um, I, I grew up in a family like of hockey fans, but no one had actually played hockey until me, so it was... Um, a lot of trust in those coaches and mentors that, that I did have. And they kind of guided myself and my parents on, on the best decisions to make as far as advancing my hockey career. But the USHL was always referred to as, you know, that's where you want to be. If you want to want to progress, I was kind of, you know, prime a goal um, when I was in midgets to move on to. So, um, and I, I obviously, you know, you can say, you're a pro hockey player, so um, you made some right decisions. But uh, the USHL is the right decision in so many more reasons than than just my hockey career. Well, and you wound up on a Class A organization in the Cedar Rapids Rough Riders after you were selected in the fifth round there. You make your way down there for the 2008-2009 season, and you get to play for, drum roll, the legendary Mark Carlson. We've heard some great stories from some of the Cedar Rapids alumni that we've already had on this podcast. I've heard plenty others off of the microphone about Carly. I think about Alex Daylock's story where he talks about drawing up plays for practice and circling the neutral zone circles a thousand times saying, if you go inside of the circle, we will restart the drill. Very detail oriented. When you think about Mark Carlson, what do you think of? For sure, detail oriented. I, I remember, you know, being a goalie, like obviously Al is too, but 
um, I'll never forget the way he, he would teach how to defend for the defenseman on the PK and skates always had to be up the ice skates always had to be up the ice and it was always you know it was ingrained that you know this is a way that you can take away more passing lanes so that was like one little coaching thing about him I remember but I just remember you know Carly is very detailed oriented and when I was there there was times where you know I would get, I'd be frustrated but looking back on it you know the the amount of accountability that he puts into your own game um, from from your standpoint it was incredible for me and um, you know kind of being your own toughest critic is kind of what he taught taught me um, and I wouldn't be where I am without Mark Carlson that's for sure um, you know we had we had our battles and especially I, I was young immature kid when I when I came in and um, he definitely put me on a path to, be, to becoming you know accountable and and a good young man and um, I can't thank him enough. I'll never forget uh, my first USHL shutout. He, uh, it took me a while to get, I think, but he was the one that kind of came over and gave me the puck and gave me a big hug. And, uh, you know, my, I still have a picture. My house, my billet mom uh, took a picture of it, and I still have it. And um, definitely an incredible memory that I'll always cherish. What was life like away from the stable? It's a great building. It's a great fan base. But when you weren't there, when you weren't practicing, what was Troy Grosinick getting up to in the town of Cedar Rapids with, I would imagine, your teammates? Yeah, I uh, spent a lot of time with the teammates. I actually lived not the furthest, but um, I lived on kind of the north, north side of the city, um, about 10-minute, 15-minute drive to the rink, so not, not anything crazy, but um, lived a little bit away from a lot of the guys, especially the guys that were going to high school. Um, but we would, you know, we would finish up our day. I, I was out of, I was out of school my first year. Uh, I took a, a class at Kirkwood Community College to try to get some credits. Um, so I did that for half the year and then I worked, um, for half the year, uh, at a gym kind of doing janitorial type stuff. Um, so that was my mornings. My mornings was either the school or the work and then, uh, practice. And then we'd get to hang out with the guys. And um, I used I, my second year, like Nick Lappin, Justin Kovacs, and I hung out just about every day. Um, they had a pool table in their basement. They lived together with the same billets. Um, and we, we went down and, and played pool all the time. And uh, I, those two were really good. I wasn't a very good pool player at the time, but I got better throughout the year. But I didn't win many games of pool that year. The names and the faces of teammates and opponents, you think about any hockey player that thinks back about their career, and those are the, the names and the faces are, are what I think a lot of people remember most. I want to talk about whether it be a teammate or an opponent, who are some of the guys that you remember thinking, I just cannot stop this guy when he comes down on me, whether it be in practice or in a game. Is there anybody that comes to mind when I ask you that question? I don't know. Um, I, I really – it's something that I kind of started learning in the USHL. My first, my first, you know, couple months was rough and I had a lot of self doubt. I remember I just wanted to make it to the Halloween party. Like I, like I just wanted to make it to Halloween party. That was my goal at the start. Like I didn't have a lot of self confidence in my game, just being around all those guys on our own team. I mean, um, we had a really good team. Like I just remember getting lit up in practice by guys like Robin Bergman and Mike Seidel and, and Kyle Flanagan, just to name a few. And I was just trying to to hold on. And, uh, you know, I, I did, obviously. And that self-confidence started to come and arise. But, um, yeah, I, I think the one that really sticks out, actually, and I don't know if it's because I've gotten to know him through the years. We, we skate together in the summers quite a bit. But Danny Christo. He was in Omaha, I think, at the time, and he, and he was awesome. I think he played World Juniors while he was at in Omaha, and um, so I, I definitely remember um, Danny Cristo was always the tough customer. But I don't even know if he scored on me or anything like that. But I just remember being pretty pretty wild by the skill that he had and and still has. Same question, vice versa. Is there anybody you remember thinking this guy will not beat me, and I made sure he never beat me because you had his number? Ah. Uh, no, no. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> Maybe. Um, I'm trying to think. It probably would have been guys that I had played with um, 
previously. So um, Garrett Peterson was in Lincoln and we played together for Team Illinois. Um, so probably him. And then my second year, once trades started to happen and um, all that type of stuff, I'd always played with more guys that were in Cedar Rapids. So I remember Ben Lynch got traded to Lincoln too. Um, so a few guys like that, but mostly it wasn't ever like, I'm not letting this guy score on me because he stinks or anything like that. It was more so he's my buddy, so I don't want to let him score. But it's funny, like, I don't, I can't remember back if, if those guys actually did score on me in the USHL, but I know for a while there, I was, I was giving up a lot of goals to guys that I'd played with before. So maybe I'm, I'm giving them too many secrets in practice on how to beat me or something, but um, it happened. Matt Bodie actually scored his first uh, pro goal on me. It was like an overtime game winner. I played with him at Union. And his, his rookie year in Hartford, he scored an overtime game winner on me, beat us when I was in Worcester. It's one I'll never forget. And then Dan Carr, who also played with me at Union, scored like four goals on me two years ago when he was in Chicago and I was in Milwaukee. So I've got a habit of giving up goals to the guys that, that I don't want to give goals up to. So that's the key is get to know you and you'll have more success against you, right? Yes, I'm just a nice guy, you know, just a, <laughs> just a good guy. I don't know. No, well, definitely well, not. It, uh, it, it really it, – both of those times, they, it rattled me to no end. Actually, it was funny. The Carsey one especially because, I mean, it went all over Twitter, you know, it, and we both follow all the union hockey stuff still. So, like, the union hockey stuff was saying, oh, Carsey scores four. It might have been even five. I don't even remember. But uh, – the next, I don't know if it's the next game, but later that season, I actually got a shutout against Chicago, and I remember being like, "Where's the love? Where's the love? I just <laughs> shut him out. Where's the love?" Yeah. So the scouting reports for normal goalies is uh, low blocker or a high glove. Yours is add him on Facebook, become his friend, something like that. <laughs> Take him to dinner. I want to get to Union. You bring it up. Um, my last USHL question I have for you, Troy, is you talked about the self-confidence side of it, but year two, you had just a fabulous season, 44 games. You started and you carried a big load with the Rough Riders that year on the way to a playoff appearance, which the Rough Riders do frequently. Um, but that second year was big for you. You make the USHL All-Star game that season. When you look back at the USHL, you bring up the self-confidence, yes, but when you think of Troy Grosinick coming in compared to Troy Grosinick leaving on his way to Union College, what do you think changed? I grew up, honestly. Like, that was, like, probably the two biggest years for, for me turning into, you know, just a, a high school kid into, you know, a, a real young man that had a, a better head on his shoulders and um, just viewed the world in a different way. And um, the way – Carly runs the program there like the, it's it's bound to happen um you're gonna grow up by going there and um it, it obviously it, it affected everything for me um outside outside of hockey and inside of hockey like I think one of the biggest things about growing up I didn't have self-confidence less because of um you know people didn't tell me I was good or anything like that it was more so that I didn't know how to give myself that self-confidence. You know, I saw myself getting scored on in practice as, you know, oh, I, I'm not that good. Instead of looking at it as an opportunity to get better or realizing that, you know, because of this and that, like, you should get scored on in practice. If you're not, you're not challenging yourself to actually get better. And so there's little things like that that I just learned throughout that time and, and how to become a better hockey player and a better person in, in total. I'll, I'll never forget, I was late to, like, two two events like early on in in, in the my USHL career one was not a fault of my own I didn't I'll still I'll still give myself the benefit of the doubt because I didn't have uh texting on my phone at the time my phone was only phone calls and so they changed a meeting but it was in a text group which obviously I didn't get text and and there was no phone call and so I strolled in like 20 minutes late to this meeting without really knowing. Oh, and so I, that was a tough one. I'll never forget that one. I'll never hold that one down. Um, but there was, a, there was another time where I, I was legitimately late to, I don't even remember what it was, if it was just a team meeting or practice or something like that. And just being held accountable for stuff like that. You know, it wasn't midgets anymore where, you know, you could say, oh, I hit traffic or anything like that. There's no, like, this is a time you have to be there period end of story and um 
just learning things like that and how to hold yourself accountable um, and show up on time and stuff like that. Not that I didn't know to show up on time. Like I was doing what I could to show up on time, but obviously time management, I guess, is the better way to put it. Um, just so many little things like that, that, that being there taught me and, and turned me into the person I am today. And uh, couldn't be more thankful to, to Mark or the, the really the whole Rough Riders organization as a whole. Clearly a smart kid when you were coming out of Cedar Rapids. You don't just walk into Union College as someone who can't walk into a classroom and get the job done. I'd imagine it's a little bit of a different experience than maybe looking around at the rest of the college hockey climate and thinking Union might be a little different than some of the other hockey powers that you could go to. And you walked into a Union College that really hadn't put itself on the map yet compared to where it's at now. You were kind of at the foundation and the building blocks of that Union Dutchman program, which is very respected now and wasn't, wasn't not respected then, but certainly is more now than it was when you got there. What was it like to be a part of Union College hockey at that time and maybe compared to where some of the other places that your teammates from Cedar Rapids were going? You know, I, I didn't know 100% what I was getting myself into, but I just had a really good gut feeling about, you know, I grew up in Milwaukee, always growing up a Badgers fan and stuff like that. And when I originally came to Cedar Rapids, I, you know, I thought I wanted to be a Badger and it actually became a little bit of a rallying cry. Wisconsin had, had offered me something that, you know, upon thinking about with my family and, and talking about with Coach Carlson, actually, you know, we decided, you know, I, I don't know if it's the right fit. And so I ended up saying, you know what, maybe that's not my dream anymore. And um, I decided on Union, which is a small school, which I actually really liked the feeling of. And um, I really, I think the best thing that I did was I wanted my college choice to be not only about hockey, but about school as well. Um, and the academics of Union, I just felt fit more so than anywhere else I was, I was being offered. And it's not to say that it's the right choice for everybody by any choice of the imagination, but it was the right choice for me. And especially it was a, it was, it was a financial need based uh, school. So there's no athletic scholarships or anything like that. And um, just knowing what I had gone through in Cedar Rapids, as far as earning playing time and stuff like that, that it actually kind of spoke to me, not that any college coach is going to only play scholarship players or anything like that, but, there's, there's literally no incentive um, money-wise for, for the coaches at Union to be playing a guy over another guy. And just having like a free state of mind when it came into that type of stuff was huge for me. Everything was merit-based. That was it. Like how you're playing, how you're practicing, that's going to determine, determine playing time. And that, those were kind of the reasons that I ended up picking Union. And then when I got there, I just fell in love. And, and I think they did a great job of kind of bringing in the the guys that they felt fit their culture and when you do that you're more apt to develop the best relationships that you can and looking back on it like those teams were close and like I think college hockey does provide that because you're going to school together you're spending all day together you're living together you're playing hockey together you know it's not like pro hockey now where we meet each other at the rink and then I go home to my family and, you know, the young guys might hang out outside the rink, but not everybody on the team is nearly as close outside away from the rink as, as you are in college. And, um, you know, it's like still some of my best friends, like the best three years of my life, bar none. And uh, when I committed there, they were kind of, they were having a good year because I committed relatively late, even in my second year. And uh, they were having a good year. Um, I think, I think it was a, they, it was like the first time they'd actually made like the ECAC final or something like that and just barely missed out on an NCAA tournament bid. So they were building something. The momentum was changing and um, I came in and can't say I had a ton of to do with it my first year because I played like 90 minutes. But um, my first year there was the first time they made the NCAA tournament. And obviously uh, the year after I left, they they won it. So with within a span of, you know, four or five years, really just that program took off and um you know i think it was a huge culture thing like i said and just 
having a group of guys that wanted to do everything together, period. No, no ifs, ands, or buts. And it was definitely a special time. Well, you did have a lot of input after your freshman year when you took the crease for the Dutchman, specifically your sophomore season, when you think about the words Troy Grosnick and Ken Dryden award winner, what comes to mind about that year? Uh, honestly, like I was on a really good team. That's what comes to mind. Like, All goalies I'll, say that. I wish one time a goalie would say, man, you know what? I was just on fire that year. <laughs> like I had a really good year, but it really like I – this, this is another, like, a little bit of a self-confidence, like, and, and learning how to overcome stuff or not putting too much pressure on yourself probably at this point in my career. But when, it, when I came back from my sophomore year, Keith Kincaid had left and Corey Mil Milan, Milan had graduated. And so I was the only guy on the roster that had any sort of college experience, two incoming freshmen. And I, you know, I put a lot of pressure on myself early like I'm talking even before we play games, like my practices weren't, weren't good. Cause I was, I was thinking too much. I was putting way too much pressure on myself and, you know, I didn't want to be the reason that the team was let down knowing going into the season that I was kind of the question mark, like he's unproven and this team looks like really good on paper, but what's the goaltending look like? And I just wanted to be sure I wasn't the guy that, that let anybody down and, Actually, it was really early, like a week into practices, not even. Um, Jason Tapp, who was the goalie coach at the time, now he's the associate head coach there, um, kind of sat me down and said, hey, like, we have a really good team. You don't need to be putting that type of pressure on yourself. You go out and you do what you do. We have all the confidence in the world that, that you're the best goalie for our team right now, and, and you go out and, and you play your game. Like, we have all the confidence in the world in you. And that, like – that meant the world because I, it was kind of a weight lifted off my shoulders and just go out and play, know that you've got a great team in front of you, both offensively and defensively and, you know, just have fun with it and, and go along with the ride. And so I did, but I remember another funny one was I, my first game, our first game that year was against army at army and army's always going to bring everything they got. Like that's, that's what they're known for. Right. And, so it was early in the game and we're favored to win, but early in the game, like second, the first shot hits my pad, juicy rebound guy, like taps home the rebound. We're down one, nothing like five minutes into the game. And I was like, all right, here we go. Great start to the year. <laughs> but we ended up winning eight to one, but I'll just never forget like being able to release, like just kind of laugh at it is what I did. I was like, okay, here we go. And just being able to laugh that off. I think it showed like, the growth and where I'd come from, um, you know, early in my USHL days where I probably would have been, you know, like, Oh, can't let another one. Can't let another one. That's when things kind of start can start to tumble on you. And I just laughed it off and won eight to one. And that set us on the path to do what we did the rest of the year. We say you had a great team and indeed you did, but you had a 165 goals against and a 936 save percentage. You still have to be a pretty good goalie to get those numbers, even if you're on a hall of fame team. Yeah, I mean, it's it is what it is. I think I as a goalie, I've also like learned I really don't pay I couldn't tell you the numbers I had in any year. Like I could tell you like good years and bad years in terms of like yeah, I probably had a good year number wise or bad year number but like there's another thing I actually learned in in the USHL and Cedar Rapids. I remember I got mad one time because I thought I was getting you know, the the shot counter wasn't right. And I remember saying something and kind of getting an earful. And it's really like, that's not what it's about. Like coaches and scouts and whoever you might think is looking at box scores, like they're smarter than that. They know good hockey from not good hockey. Like if you're good enough, like they're going to see that. And I was at the time, you know, I'm thinking about my, my future. Like I wanted to go to college and all that type of stuff. And I, thought the way there was stats and that couldn't be further from the case. Like I had to control my own game, focus on what I could control and everything else would take rest, take care of itself. So even to this day, I really try not to look into stats too much um, and just, just try to stop the next puck because that's the most important thing. In terms of team sports, you think about goaltending and pitching 
and maybe quarterbacks, but I would probably keep them on the outside of this discussion. You think about goaltending and pitching in terms of positions in team sports that you spend the most time inside your own head. From a mental standpoint as a goaltender, what do you think is the most important aspect of your goaltending prowess inside your own head? Focusing on what I control, honestly. And it, um, it, it, it's so funny because I really, like, over the past years, as I've grown, grown older and stuff and had more responsibility outside of hockey, knowing how learning those lessons of controlling what you control, everything else that you can't control, like why think about it? Because at the end of the day, you're just worrying about something that you don't have any control over. So you're not going to change it. All you can do is change the things and your attitude um, around those things happening around you. And learning that pretty young as, as a goalie and especially in the USHL um, it's helped me so much as a goalie, but it's also helped me outside in, in my personal life. And um, it's one of those things where they, t they say sports teach you so much more than the final score or the stats or anything like that. And in my case, like it couldn't be, couldn't be more true and like very thankful that I grew up playing hockey and, like, it's probably the most important thing that it's taught me, to be honest. So your time at Union comes to an end, and now it's off to pro hockey. A little different route, undrafted. You start with the, the Sharks organization, eventually work your way up. You have had a handful of games in the NHL and an immense amount of success at the AHL level. What's that process like once you graduate, looking at everything and trying to decide what you're going to do as an undrafted player looking to play pro hockey? Actually – like I, I always say, it's the hardest decision of my life was when I left Union. And um, there were a few things that went into it. I mean, I knew that, I mean, my end goal at Union was to win a national championship. And I knew we had the team to be able to do that, which they proved me right. And I, so like, it was really hard to leave a really, really good team and a team that was basically your best friends. And I, I remember I, I cried. I didn't tell really many people that, that I had made my decision and was signing. And we actually were all together. And the boys kind of like made this big announcement in front of the rest of the guys that, that I was leaving. And everyone was congratulating me and stuff like that. But like I was crying because I was leaving those guys. And, um, you know, it was emotional and it was, it was bittersweet for sure. And, uh, I, I just determined that, you know, my goal and my dream was to play pro hockey and, and someone was giving me a really good shot to do that. And um, I had also determined before I actually signed that um, academically union is going to let me come back and um, take some summer courses. And actually I finished writing my thesis um, while I was playing pro hockey. So um, my last, uh, my last semester was, the fall semester, my pro, uh, first pro year, and uh, got my degree in December. And um, at the end of the day, like being able to get that degree really put my mind at ease that, you know, I made the right decision to go play pro hockey. And uh, I don't know if you can hear my, my son came in. It's, it's almost nap time. So yes. he's, he's heading to bed. But um, being able to get my degree and still fulfill, like, chase my dreams that was that was the biggest um thing that, that came in if i if i wasn't going to be able to get my degree within a couple of years i i don't know if i would have left so um those were kind of the factors going into the decision for sure so we'll, we'll keep it short and sweet with the the pro talk just because we know the little one needs to get to bed and everything but you're a ushl guy ushl guys have a ton of pride Obviously, the AHL especially is littered with AHL players – or sorry, with USHL players. But then when you get up in the NHL, same thing. Do you ever run into guys that you played against, old teammates, and reminisce at all? Or do you keep in touch with any of your Cedar Rapids teammates or any of your counterparts from the league? For sure. Um, so Matt Donovan played with me in Cedar Rapids, and we were teammates again this year – well, the last two years. Um, so that was really cool. And – um, Dono and I played together one year in Cedar Rapids, um, but I, so he came in the year after I was traded. So I'd already been with the Admirals for the tail end of a year 
and Dono actually reached out to me saying that he was signing and um, knowing that I was from the area and played there was kind of like asking for you know advice on where to live and stuff like that he's got a son that's about a year and a half older than my son and another son that was born while he was in Milwaukee so you know just being at the same stage of life and already having you know known each other for 10 years or so like it makes things a lot easier as a pro hockey player that you know somebody everywhere you go and even skating now um in the summers like I, I talked about Christo and I have skated a ton together um you you play with like it's it's almost a rarity that that you see a guy that didn't play in the USHL um, if he's American. So it's, it's been really cool. And we definitely reminisce and tell stories of like, this is what happened, you know, when I was playing in Green Bay, or this is what happened when I was playing in Cedar Rapids. And um, it's really cool to look back on, on a younger version of yourself and, you know, maybe laugh about some of the decisions you made and, and reminisce about the good times too. So it's, um, you know, if I had like a message, like, to any kid thinking about playing in the USHL or in the USHL would be like it's the best decision like my family made and that I look back on those years not only with all the great memories of of playing with great teammates but also knowing that it's it's propelled me on to to bigger things in hockey and life and um like I can't say it enough like I wouldn't be here today like as the husband and father and son that I am outside of hockey even um, if I if I didn't play in Cedar Rapids so um, definitely near and dear to my heart. That's about as good of a finishing statement as you can get. I, I, I'm ashamed that I have one final question to ask you that's going to make that – hopefully you can come up with a better answer that you can't because it's about golf. But, I mean, that was a fabulous answer, but I had to ask you because I, I know – Mike and you're asking about golf. <laughs> Yeah, because I know you're a big golfer, Troy. I know that's something that's big for you. I know Minnesota was closed for a while. So I'm always curious to talk about golf because I know it's big in the hockey world. We do have the official leader on the leaderboard of these podcasts we've had so far. Handicap wise is Dominic Toninato, handicap six. He says, again, we haven't, we haven't been able to, to figure out if that's real or not, but what's your handicap and has it increased or decreased or COVID-19? Um, so actually it's decreased a lot, um, which is weird. I know. So I think, so I keep a handicap app um, and I, I actually have to go back and actually look at it because I must've had some pretty high scores in there or something. Um, but I went, I've gone from a 10 down to an eight um, in quarantine. And there's a couple reasons. One I think has to do with the scores towards the end the end of last summer I, I wasn't striking the ball well and two when when I got news that they were shutting down golf courses up here I went out and I bought a golf simulator so <laughs> I've been it's been my it's been my guilty pleasure I was like you know what okay I'm gonna get my workouts in and stuff like that during the day be a father all that stuff when Becca goes to bed like I'll have the simulator all set up in the basement so my game actually like I've been hitting more golf balls than I probably ever have in my life. And I've actually, so the last two rounds that I, that I've played, I've shot 78 and 79. So it's been helping for sure. Um, and I've got about five, five or so rounds in, um, on the courses since they've opened up here in Minnesota. Um, and it's been really cool too, because, um, it's one of the few places that you can get out and, feel safe and so back at my son and I like get get him out of my wife's hair for for a few hours so we'll go to the course together and um, I get to play around and have him you know hit from the tees and and putt around a little bit and um, so it's been great not only for my golf game but just being able to spend time with Becca and hopefully um, he already loves hockey that's for sure he uh, is always playing in the driveway but if he's uh if he's into hockey and golf, both, then uh, I consider that a huge win. Are you going to try to keep him out of the goal crease as much as possible? Do you want to be a goalie parent? My wife, my wife doesn't want him to be a goalie. I can tell you that. <laughs> but um, I'm gonna let him do whatever he wants to do. You know, whatever um, makes him happy. And like I said, it seems like he really likes hockey and golf right now. But if if that changes, if if he doesn't want to play hockey, like I just I want him to find his passion. 
at the end of the day, that's probably how you're going to succeed at something anyway. Um, so if his passion happens to be basketball or playing a piano or playing a guitar, whatever his passion is, I just want to make sure he finds his passion and that I can, you know, incubate that in any way possible. I'm not very musically in inclined, so we'll be hiring that out to, to music teachers if that's the route he decides to go. But, um, you know, obviously anything in the hockey world, I can uh, hopefully be of, uh, of good service, um, not only as, as a dad, but as a, as a hockey player. And, and that's the goal. It's, um, yeah, fatherhood is, is amazing. Like it's, it's the coolest thing that I've been able to do. And just seeing the amount of joy that, that Beckett gets out of the things that I enjoy um, has been really rewarding. Well, this interview has put a smile on my face. This has been a great uh, time together, Troy. I really enjoyed a lot of your, uh, your comments and your discussion here uh, with us. We've gone long, which we tend to unfortunately do, um, but hopefully you've enjoyed it half as much as we have. Chris, anything that you want to add before we close it out? No, all good. Thanks awesome. for having me, guys. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I tend to be a talker, too, so I, I, the whole uh, go long thing uh, is no news to me. <laughs> well that's we prefer fine. it that way it's, it's better to have that than to have to try to drag answers out of you that's that's no fun on our end yeah well it's been a lot of fun and uh thanks for having me another big thanks to troy for joining us we you know we talked about it in the intro so we don't have to delve on it anymore but a really good interview um with a great guy so thanks to him and his time and you know really showing us how good of a person he is and how much he does for the sport, not only on the ice, but off it. It's interesting. My wife brought this up the other day. We were talking about my friend group and, and she said, you, you have a lot of goalie friends and I'm not calling Troy Grosnick a friend. Um, but I certainly seem like I'd like to be his friend based off that interview. He was a great interview, but I, I think I've always had a soft spot for goalies. I love goalies. I think that they're so interesting and so intriguing and they're usually so funny. Like goalies are always, they're, I would, like I, I didn't ask that question to Troy, the funny or strange question, because I'm trying to not ask it to every goalie we interview, but they're always so interesting. And I think Troy nails that and, and, um, really enjoyed this one and was really grateful to get to, to spend some time with him uh, during that interview. And, and I thought he was just a, a dandy of an interview to put out. So I'm sure the fans really loved it. Well, Ben, you said most of your friends are goalies. That might be a sign that you are weird as well. I think, you know what? I, I, it's not a sign, Chris. That's a hundred percent guarantee. If anybody <laughs> that's listening does know me, that's listening to this podcast right now, they're going, Chris, that's a hundred percent guarantee. That's not a maybe. He's very weird. Yeah. If you would have told me you played goalie, I totally would have been, would have been surprised. <laughs> that's a, and that's a compliment, I think. But Okay, okay, that's it, fair. That's it's fair. weird in a good way, not weird in like, yes. what is this guy doing? I kind of want to hang out with that guy. So. Yeah, yeah, no doubt, no doubt. It's very, it's very keen observation. I think I would have been a terrible goalie, but my, my mentality and my personality, I think, would have fit it to a T. Goalie at heart. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Maybe that'll be my new Twitter handle. At goalie at heart. There we go. <laughs> well, before we go, we'd be remiss not to thank Charlie Larson from Milwaukee for setting this up. Great guy. I had the chance to work with him in the past when I was with Atlanta. So um, he's a class act. He's been around for a long time, um, as most of the people in the Admirals of Milwaukee's organization are. So thanks to Charlie for setting all this up. Thanks to Troy for his time once again. And thanks, Ben, as always, for being alongside for the ride. I'm Chris Treft, and this was the You Show Podcast. This is the You Show Podcast.